I, w- I want to read. You can stay standing or you can sit down. I'm going to read them real quick. I think they're going to put them up. Three, three passages short. Two of them pretty short. Passages of Scripture. And, and I'm going to talk about some things that the Lord has laid on my heart. I, I've battled with this message. And so uh, uh, I, I, just from the beginning, don't you be offended till you've heard the whole thing, okay? Don't get caught up in some little thing Steve Skipper says in the middle of it. Wait till the end. Wait till the end. First passage I want to read is Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And it's a blessing to be here tonight with your pastor, with your presbyter, with these leaders from our district, all the pastors that are here tonight, friends of our ministry that people in this room have, have given to Elizabeth and I. Help us go around the world preaching the gospel. And we're so grateful for the souls in this room, the people in this room, the soldiers in this room who stood with us in ministry. We just want you to know that. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. And in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, tears in my eye, I can't see, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration, the daily feeding. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said unto them, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then I want to read Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus is speaking and he says, reading actually, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them, them that are bruised and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, We are healed. Father, in Jesus' name. Don't let me do anything, God. Don't let me do anything or say anything that would disrupt this atmosphere right now. That that would disrupt this, 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 this space that has already been created for the work of the Holy Ghost in our midst tonight. Help me, God, to not just speak, but to speak with a prophetic voice. Let it be as on the day of Pentecost when Peter proclaimed he was, he was prophesying. He was speaking out in the power of the, you know, the Spirit gave utterance. Let me the Spirit give utterance tonight. Let ears hear the word of the Lord. Let every heart receive the word that you have for them tonight. I'm going to give you... Praise and count on you, Holy Spirit, to communicate what you've placed in my heart. I give you all the glory. All the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love the name that you have placed on this conference. Resurgence. Resurgence Conference. I'm sure it's already been brought to your attention. I think I saw it up there. Yes, that resurgence is actually a synonym for revival. It's also a synonym for renewal. It's also a synonym for resurrection. (laughs) Resurgence. And obviously it means to surge again. And the reason I like that, pastors, the reason I like that, Brother Bays, is because if there was ever a day that the Pentecostal Church of Jesus Christ needed to surge again, it's today. Come on. We, we are living in a day. When too many of our churches, look at your neighbor and say, not my church. When too many of our churches have find themselves looking very much like 
the early church did here in the book of Acts chapter 6. You see, the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. The church of Jesus Christ birthed supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit in the earth. And we, we, we even we Pentecostals, Brother Bays, we, we, we understate what it must have been like on that day when Holy Spirit himself was poured out upon all flesh. I, I think it was probably like a nuclear explosion that hit the earth. Come on. And there was a surge. There was a surge, and the church went forth, even from humble beginnings of 120 people. We got more than that here tonight. And they surged, and thousands of people, thousands of people were saved. Thousands of people were saved. There were miracles. There were signs and wonders. Lives were changed. Eternity was transformed. Demonstration, manifestation of the Holy Ghost. There was this powerful surge. But just like history has shown us over and over again, it's true here in Acts chapter 6 and true with too many Pentecostal churches today. Following that original surge, there was this pullback. There was a, a pullback, a, a regression to, to a more comfortable <laughs> comfort place. And there was this pullback in which the church pulled back to being a, a, a more politically correct, more, more actually culturally centric. Uh oh. You just thought I was going to shout, didn't you? Actually, the church in Jerusalem had become Jerusalem-centric. They become Jewish-centric. I wish I could say, Pastor, I wish I could say that they were predominantly Jewish, but I can't say that. They were exclusively Jewish. Rather than being the church that God had created them to be, rather than being the great commissioned church of Jesus Christ to going into all the world, they had stepped back. They had pulled back become culturally centric. And the result of that, if you read chapter 5 and 6, was, maybe just look around you today, was apostasy and murmuring. Don't you love the word murmur? You don't have to get the dictionary out for that one. Murmur. Chapter 5. The apostasy came. It was not just hypocrisy. It was not just some backsliding. But the Bible says that Satan had entered their hearts. And it was an apostasy. It was a turning from faith. It was a denial of the faith. They were making a mockery of God. It was a falling away. Look around today. I'll make that rhyme. But there wasn't just apostasy. But there was also murmuring, <laughs> bickering. Yes, they were being attacked from outside. Yes, there was all kinds of persecution. But this was internal. This was, this, this was, this was infighting. This was strife and, and murmuring and bickering and picking on one another and beating each other up and tearing each other down inside the body. Pullback always results in apostasy and bickering, and murmuring. You don't have to say, man, it's true. I've been in this thing too long not to know that. And so we have a response here from the apostles. They see what's going on. They recognize this is not right. What's happening is not right. We've got, we got a falling away. We've got this murmuring, bickering going on. People are tearing each other up. 
And from a superficial point of view, it would look like that the response of the apostles was to empower the body to elect seven leaders from among them, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, and to put them into leadership, to put them into uh, uh, really apostolic function leadership. These men were not deacons as, as some think. These men had already distinguished themselves in the body as called by God and they were elected by the body. They were laid hands on by the body. They were put into an apostolic function. The ministry to the tables was something that the apostles had been doing and then they continued to operate in apostolic function preaching the gospel. And I'm all for that. I'm all for putting more people in ministry. I'm all for recognizing the call of God amongst us. And letting them be what God's called them to be. But there's really something deeper here. And it's going to shock some of you when I say it, but hang in here till the end. I believe there's something deeper here. There's something deeper that Peter does in this passage in Acts 6 that I believe was transformative. I believe it, it transformed this, this culture-centric, this, 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 this Jerusalem-centric, this, this Jewish-centric church that was not fulfilling the Great Commission into a Great Commission church that took the gospel into all the world, to the Gentiles, to everyone, and turned the world upside down. And it's where Peter says, it's not reason. It's not correct. It's not a good thing that we neglect the word. Later he says, ministry of the word, ministry of the gospel. And the word he uses there for ministry is the word diakovia in the Greek. And diakovia is the word in the Old New Testament that describes the ministry of the apostles, the ministry of pastors, the ministry of the church. It's the ministry word. And he says, it's not right for us to neglect the diakonia, the, the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ to serve tables. And actually, it's very powerful there. That word serve is really mistranslated as well because it's diakonia as well. Yeah. Ministry. He says, it's not right for us to leave the ministry of the gospel to minister the tables, and by using the Echovia, he was not in any way diminishing pastors. He was not in any way depreciating the ministry to tables, the ministry to the widows. But what he was doing, I believe, is he was prioritizing something. He was prioritizing the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now hear me tonight. It's the same thing that Jesus did himself. At Mary Martha's house. Martha was busy waiting on her guests, taking care of them, hospitality. And her sister is sitting over at the feet of Jesus. And she gets upset. And she says, Jesus! I don't know what she did. I'm just imagining. Sad that I can do a female crowd in. But anyway. Jesus! Why are you letting her sit over there? Why well, I've got all this. Well, look at these people. Look at all we got to do. Look at what I'm doing here. And Jesus comes to her. And he says, Martha. And he uses his diacovia. Ministry. He says, Martha, the ministry you're doing, the, the ministry you're doing is great. 
This hospitality that you're doing here, it's great. It's wonderful. He doesn't depreciate. He doesn't demean it in any way. But he turns and he says, but Martha, Mary has chosen the better. And he uses Diakovi again, the ministry of the gospel, the ministry of the word. Come on now. I believe if we're going to wake from the stupor that we've been in as the modern Pentecostal church, if we're going to get out of this pullback that I see happening in too many churches, if we're going to get moved in a new surge in our generation, we're going to have to prioritize gospel ministry. All right, so Brother Skipper, define gospel ministry. Thankfully, Jesus did that for me. So I don't have to go out on a limb. Most theologians agree. Even our Pentecostal, two, two great theologians wrote great on this. Gary McGee and uh, uh, Benny uh, Aker. That when Jesus, in the second passage we read, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, when he is reading from the 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 messianic prophecies of Isaiah. And you you remember he he comes from Jordan, baptized water, baptized in the Holy Ghost. We know that because Luke says Jesus is full of the Holy Ghost. Comes, He wins temptation over Satan, comes in the power of the Spirit, and he stands up in the synagogue in Nazareth. And he's to read, and they bring to him. Obviously, there's no accident. It's not by accident. He got the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet. And he opens it up to what we've canonized in 61. And he reads and he personalizes. He attributes that passage to himself. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he hath anointed me to preach. He hath anointed me to heal. He hath anointed me to restore. He hath anointed me to liberate. And says that and says, today... This scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. In other words, Jesus defines gospel ministry as word and deed. He says this gospel is a word that must be preached. It's a word that must be proclaimed. It's a word that must be heralded, proclamational. But he doesn't stop there. He says it's also a deed. It's also this gospel, something that must be demonstrated. It is the demonstration of the finished, uh, redemptive work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Hallelujah. Now, I don't want to spend a long time, and I've already had with that, just getting this far. That was page one and a half. I got four of them. I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on word because I think I'm in a mature audience here that understands that this gospel must be preached. <laughs> this gospel is a word that it must be proclaimed. And when I say that, I'm not talking about <laughs> seven lessons from the seven dwarfs. Come on. I'm not talking about ten... <laughs> Ways of sowing so you can increase uh, your financial portfolio. I'm not talking about whitewashed walls. I'm not talking about catering to itching ears. I'm talking about the proclamation, the preaching of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Christ, as the Savior, as the Messiah, as the Lamb that was slain for the redemption of mankind. Two primary words in the New Testament used for communicating the, the, the means by which the church should communicate the gospel are caruso and evangelizo. And they both are interchangeable. They both mean the same thing. They both come from the idea of a town crier. <laughs> They they come from this idea of the town crier going through the streets and with everything in him, crying out and crying out and proclaiming, heralding. Come on now. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. 
Paul said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he says, how are they going to call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they going to believe on him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I don't know if I'm getting this through or not. I may have to stay here longer. Pentecostal proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ preaching is under attack as part of the pullback. It's looked upon by, by many not just outside the church but inside the churches. Archaic. Foolishness. Idiocracy. For the fat guy to get up here and yell about Jesus being the Redeemer, the Lamb of God. Paul dealt with that, didn't he? He, he was in Corinth and he told the Corinthians, he said, All oh, you philosophers, all <laughs> oh, you, you men of the law. All you people that think you're so educated, that, that all of you that are lost, he said, you think what I'm doing when I proclaim the gospel, when I preach the gospel, it's foolishness. You see it as nothing but foolishness. You see it as nothing but foolishness. He said, but we, we who have been saved, we understand that it is the power of God unto salvation. Come on, somebody. It's time for we Pentecostals to once again preach the gospel. It's time for you and I to understand that when we proclaim, when we preach, when we herald this gospel, we are creating a space for the Holy Spirit to fulfill his missional requisite to convince and convict and draw me into Christ. We'll move on, but because I want—I got too much to say. Preachers preach the word, preach the gospel, preach Jesus. Layman in the house, preach Jesus, preach Jesus, proclaim the gospel, because it is the power of God. Under salvation. But there is an equally important second part because he says it's word and deed. And word and deed, let's get this straight, they're a union. They're a marriage. You don't have one without the other. I'm only separated because I want you to understand. They're, though they're equal aspects of the gospel. So Jesus says here that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to preach, to proclaim this gospel is a word. But he also says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he breaks up deed real great force. He says, to heal, to restore, and to liberate. <laughs> Woo! First thing he says, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal. Woo! Isaiah was prophesying about the messianic ministry. And he said, the Messiah will heal the sick. It'll, divine healing will be a part of the messianic ministry. It'll be a part. And Christ said, it's completed this day in your ears. And he went forth doing what? Healing the sick. Right here in chapter 4 alone of Luke, he comes to, to Peter's house. And his mother-in-law sick. He goes in, and she lays hands on her, and she's immediately healed. That night when the evening came, they brought all the sick from the hospitals and from the, the ambulances, and, and they all showed up, and the Bible says they all were healed. He healed the sick. But I say you, doesn't stop talking about divine healing just as a part of the messianic ministry. 
Isaiah 53, 5. Final verse of that scripture that I read to you. Isaiah says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are, we are, we are healed. Do you understand? Pastor Bays, I hope they understand that what Isaiah is doing, he's not just attributing divine healing to the ministry of the Messiah. He's attributing divine healing to the atoning work of the Messiah. He's attributing divine healing as a part of the atoning, redemptive work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Woo! The Old Testament people got it. David, Psalms 103, what does he say? He said, forget not all his benefits. And, and he's talking about the atonement. We know that because he says, forgiveth all thine iniquities. That the Messiah is going to die for us. He's going to give himself for us. He's going to, so that we might be forgiven. We might be pardoned. And then he says, who healeth all, all, all. Oh, 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 not just the sniffles, uh, not just uh, a little cold, uh, uh, not just cancer, not just, oh, come on now, not just heart disease, all oh, our diseases. New Testament church got it as well. First thing we read there in chapter 3, of Acts following the birth of the church. Peter and John are on their way where? To the temple. There's the lame guy that always begs money. The guy that's always looking for an answer to his problem through human resource. And I don't like to think that Peter and John were broke when they said silver and gold have I none. I like to think what they were saying was, buddy, all the silver and gold in Jerusalem is not going to meet your need. All the money in the world is not going to meet your need. And because word and deed go together, they preached a little bit. They said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately he was healed and went running and leaping and praising God. We were in southern Argentina. We were in southern Argentina preaching and, and, and raising up a church. And there was a young woman got saved, had a little baby and a husband. She got saved, and, 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 and her husband would bring her to church, but he'd never come in the church. He'd sit outside and wait on her, and then they'd go home. And, and she wanted to be a part of leadership in the church. And so on Thursday night, we had leadership class, and she came to leadership class. And, and, and one Thursday night, she just wanted to go to leadership class, and he had this horrible, he suffered from horrible migraines, horrible migraines, debilitating. And he was having one of his worst migraines, and he told her, I, I can't take him, I, I can't do it, we, you can't go. And she said, but I need to go, I need to go, I need to go. And so he was mad about it and upset about it. His head, his head was busting wide open, and they had a little baby. And, and of course, uh, he had to take care of the baby in the car while he waited on her. And when you know it, that night the preacher went long and so he had all he could stand his head was busting the baby was crying and inconsolable and he jumps out of his car he comes running in the building and he's mad he runs up the stairs I saw him coming and I met him at the top of the stairs because I knew he was mad and all I knew to do pastor is I knew he'd been sick, she told me. And so I put my hands out on him, and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be whole, be well. Right now, in Jesus' name, I curse migraines. And he goes. He goes, I'm healed. My migraine's gone. It's gone. 
And that night he received Jesus as his Savior. Come on, church. It's time to prioritize divine healing. It's time to once again call for the elders of the church. It's time to anoint them with oil. It's time to pray the prayer of faith. And minister divine healing to this generation. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal. A few pages down. He also said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to restore. The word there in the Greek, or in the, in the Greek is to restore to its original state. Mm, I like that. To bring something back to its original state. That's going to mess with some of you. He said, he said, the ministry of the Messiah will be to restore. And what did Jesus do? He went around restoring bodies. He went around restoring relationships. He went around restoring minds. He went around restoring reputations. He was a restorer of what the enemy had taken. But Isaiah says, it's not just part of the missionary ministry. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And he says, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He says he was chastised. He was disciplined for us. He, he was disciplined, he says, for our peace, for our shalom, for our literally, if you look into it, for our wholeness. <laughs> that we might be made whole. In other words, he was chastised so that we might be restored to our original condition. Joel said the same thing. Joel said in that great chapter 2, prophesying the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, talking about the day of judgment, prophesying about end times. He quotes God here and he says, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. I will restore. <laughs> New Testament church, Peter's out ministry, comes on the guy named Aeneas who's been in his bed how long, eight years? Got sick, sickness paralyzed him. Never gotten out of his bed, hadn't gotten out of his bed for eight years. <laughs> and Peter looks at him, and again, word and deed go together, he said, in the name. <laughs> he says, the Lord Jesus Christ heals you. No. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ makes you whole. That, that went right by some of them, sister. You know what he's saying? He's saying Aeneas didn't just need to be healed. He didn't just need a healing from the disease, but he needed to be restored. He needed those legs to walk again. And in that moment, Peter said to him, the Lord Jesus Christ makes you whole. Take up your bed and walk. And he went, walking. Actually, that word there in the Greek for whole is restore. We were in Argentina preaching, and after the service, a woman comes running up to me. She's screaming, Pastor, Pastor, look, Pastor, look, Pastor, look, Pastor. She's waving her arms like that. And she settled down and she said, Pastor, first time for me in a church like this. First time she'd ever been in an evangelical church. First time she felt the presence of God in her life. And she said, I, I got saved tonight. I got, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus changed my life. And then she said to me, she said to me, sister, she said, she said, and, and, and when you said, if you need a miracle, if you need a miracle, raise your hand. And she said, oh, I was born with a withered right hand. Yeah, I've not been able to use this hand all my life. It's been withered up all my life. And when you said raise your, your hand, if you need a miracle, I raised my withered hand. And look, Pastor, God has healed me. He's restored me. Hallelujah. 
It's time to quit giving up. It's time to quit saying you're just going to have to live that way. Kyle, it's what I like about Family First Ministry. They're not, they don't say to these orphans, they don't say to these, this dysfunctional and damaged generation, you're just going to have to live that way. You're just going to have to put up with it that way. People shamba ramakai, but they've come in the power of the Holy Ghost, restoring lives, bringing restoration to a generation that's damaged. This generation is not looking for a God just to forgive them, just to pardon them. They want a God that can repair what the canker worm has taken. They want a God that can restore, and it's time for the church to quit giving up and stand up in faith. Finally, y'all gonna start saying, stop saying amen and start saying, shut up. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal, to restore, and to liberate. Isaiah says the Messianic ministry is going to be a ministry of liberation. And we know that's what Jesus did. In Luke 4 alone, he walks into the temple in Capernaum. <laughs> There's a demon-possessed man there. And the Bible says in the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, the demon was cast out and the man was freed. Yeah. 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 Well, what he's saying here in Isaiah 53, I forgot to read that to you, didn't I? He says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Then he says he was bruised. He was bruised. He was bruised. For our iniquities. The, the wording there is he was crushed. He was beaten beyond recognition. Beaten into pieces. Marred beyond recognition. Why? For our punishment. For our imprisonment. For our bondage. He was beaten and bruised and marred for our freedom. There's all kinds of symbolism in the Old Testament about liberation ministry. The whole symbolism of the Exodus. You can't turn, interpret that any other way. Captivity. God raises up a man and brings them out. Symbolism of the restoring and liberating ministry of the Messiah. My favorite one is about the year of Jubilee. <laughs> you know that 50th year when, when everybody who owed a debt was forgiven their debt. When, when everybody that was in prison was set free. When everybody that was captive was given liberation. Whenever everybody that, that was a slave was set free. <laughs> the year of Jubilee. And, and I want to read it to you in Leviticus. When it was given, the law was given. He says, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hollow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all inhabitants. Did that go right by you? A certain day the trumpet was to sound. And that day was the day of atonement. <laughs> you can't get around that symbolism. It's saying to you and I that the year of Jubilee is a symbol of the liberation, of the, of the freeing work, the liberty work of Jesus Christ. Toning work of Christ. Whew. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. I put thing on my the spirit gave utterance. He ended by saying, repent, and be baptized for remission of sin, and receive ye the Holy Ghost. And a lot of theologians have got all messed up on that, but that's okay. 
Because he said remission. He didn't say forgiveness. <laughs> he didn't say pardon. He used the same Greek word that Jesus used when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me <laughs> to heal, to restore, and to liberate. <laughs> he was saying, repent and be baptized and you'll be released. You'll be given freedom. There will be liberty, liberation. Come on now, come on. It's time for the church to realize we don't have to live in bondage anymore. We don't have to live in slavery anymore. We don't have to be in captivity anymore. We don't have to live with shackles and chains anymore. We don't have to live under the bondage of addictions and vices and <laughs> lust of the flesh anymore. He's a liberator. Say, thank God he's about to shut up. Many of you know my, my testimony. I, I was born dead, and I'm not going to go into that tonight. If you want to know about that, you can have me preach for you some other time. I was born dead and premature. Because I was born premature, I wasn't fully developed. And in those days, there was no Niku. All right, there were Niku. I thought I knew what I was saying. Matter of fact, I was born in a sanatorium. <laughs> in Waxahachie, Texas, before they had the hospital. That's old. And I wasn't fully developed. And one of the things that wasn't fully developed was my lungs. And as a young child and baby and boy, four or five times a year, constantly, continually, I would get bronchitis. Any little viral infection in the air, any, any little hint of a, a sniffle from somebody, and it would go down in my lungs, and, and, and I would get sick. I mean sick, sick. I'd get a high fever. I'd cough and hack and wheeze and... Felt like I was smothering and I couldn't breathe. Sick. Mom would take me to the hospital, I mean to the doctor. Mom and dad, and they'd give me antibiotics. And in those days they just took you home and mom made a pallet on the floor and she'd sit beside me in the den of the house, the little house we lived in. And pray and believe God. And I just get sick over and over and over and over and over again. And I remember when I was six years old, about that time, I got real sick one time. And my fever was off the charts. Mom had made me a pallet. Mom and Dad were both in there praying and sitting beside me. And, 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 and I was just so sick, I dozed off and then, I'd wake up wheezing and coughing and unable to breathe. And they put Vicks in the vaporizer and all that stuff, you know, we used to have. And I was just really sick, really sick. And I dozed off, and I remember so clearly like it was yesterday. I, 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 turned, I woke up unable to breathe, and I, I was gasping for breath and coughing and fever high and I remember I turned over, and when I turned over, I looked across the room, and, and this is what I saw as a six-year-old boy. I described it. I, I said, there's a green man over there. There's a green man over there, and he's coming to kill me. I started screaming to my mom and dad, there's a green man coming after me, and I could see him as clear right now. He was marching toward me, and I knew, I knew he was trying to kill me. I knew he was trying to take my life. I know now after years of ministry that it wasn't a little green man, it was a demonic spirit, a spirit of infirmity, a spirit from hell that was trying to take my life, that was trying to kill me as a little child and keep me from fulfilling God's purpose for my life, was trying to attack me and kill me. And I jumped up 
and I took off running around this way. And mom went that way and dad went this way. And they caught up with me in the front of the house, crawled down in a corner, and I was screaming out, the little green man's coming. I see him. He's trying to kill me, trying to kill me. Both my mom and dad are now with Jesus. They were Pentecostal people who didn't know anything else to do but believe God. And mom and dad began to pray in the Holy Ghost. I can hear them now. They began to pray in the Spirit. I can hear my daddy taking dominion and authority over the little green man. <laughs> I can hear mom taking authority over sickness in my body. I can hear them praying the prayer of faith. I can hear them coming against principalities and powers. And when they began to pray in the spirit, as clear as I, as if it happened today, I saw that little green man. He was coming at me, and all of a sudden, he began to shriek and shriek and shriek, and he was gone. I've never had bronchitis again. I've never had a problem with my lungs again. He was shabaramatalamata. Are you hearing me? You see, I needed a healing. The healer was there. I was healed. But I didn't just need a healing. I needed those lungs to be restored. And he restored my lungs. But I didn't just need healing and restoration. I needed liberation because there was a demonic power trying to oppress me, trying to attack me. And the liberator showed up and showed out in the room. Stand with me tonight. Raising worship team, help me. I've gone way too long.